Moving on, having understood clearly the etiologies of the unilateral cataracts, now let us move to the bilateral cataracts and their etiology. Now, if one sees a child with bilateral cataract, one needs to think about the following broad categories. These are the cataracts because of genetic mutation, metabolic syndromes, cataracts because of chromosomal anomalies, torch infection, and we can also have various systemic syndromes leading to bilateral cataracts. First, we'll talk about the genetic mutations. So genetic mutations are likely the most common cause of bilateral cataract in children. Okay, so I want you to focus on this point. They are the most common cause of bilateral cataracts in the pediatric population. And the most common inheritance is autosomal dominant followed by the autosomal recessive and then we have the X-linked uh, inheritance. The autosomal recessive variety is mostly seen in families with a history of consanguinity. Now, more than 15 genes have actually been identified for the pediatric cataracts, but they mostly relate to the cataract proteins like the crystallins and the connexins, which is actually a gap uh, junction protein. Now, so what did we learn? We learned that the most common cause of bilateral cataract is genetic mutations inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Now, as they are almost never associated with a systemic problem. Okay. Now, these isolated inherited congenital cataracts, they actually carry a much better visual prognosis compared to those cataracts which are associated with any other ocular or systemic abnormality, right? So, these genetic cataracts do not have any other systemic or any other local or ocular anomaly except the, uh, I mean, they just have the cataract. So now we are going to move on to the next etiology of bilateral cataract and that is the metabolic cataract. So we have six etiologies here that we are going to discuss. So we have the galactosemia, Wilson disease, Fabry's disease, Lois disease, diabetic cataract, hypocalcemic or parathyroid tetany related cataract. So first let us talk about the galactosemic cataract. Right. So as the name suggests, these are the bilateral cataracts which are seen in galactosemia. OK, so what is galactosemia? Galactosemia is basically an autosomal recessive inherited congenital disease characterized by an inborn inability of the infant to metabolize galactose. So they can't really process milk. Now, the galactosemic cataract is uh, basically to understand that you should understand a little bit about the galactose metabolism. The galactose is basically metabolized into glucose through the galactose metabolism and this galactose metabolism has three important enzymes. These are the galactokinase, the galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase and the galactose epimerase. Now, an absence of any of these three enzymes involved in the conversion of this galactose to the glucose finally, okay, will lead to accumulation of this galactose in the blood, okay. Now, as the uh, levels of galactose increase in the blood and because we do not have the enzymes of the galactose metabolism, that is the galactokinase, galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase and galactose epimerase, what will happen? The galactose will take an alternative pathway of metabolism and will be metabolized using this enzyme that is the aldose reductase and leading to formation of an alcohol which is the galactitol. Now an important point to remember about this galactitol is that that it is an osmotic agent. So when this accumulation of this galactitol in the lens, what will happen? It will result in an osmotic gradient increase leading to an osmotic swelling of the lens fibers because of the hydration of the lens, right? Now, galactosemia can basically be of three types. So we can have type one in which there is this enzyme galactose 1-phosphate UDP transferase or uridyl transferase which is missing, okay? And then we have the type Type 2 which is because of the galactokinase deficiency and then we have type 3 which is because of this galactose epimerase deficiency. Now the one the one is the most severe type 2 is a milder disorder which is associated with galactosemia and cataract but it usually does not have any other systemic abnormality. So that is one important point you must remember. Now 
What about the ocular manifestations in galactosemia? So the cataract that we see in case of galactosemia is usually an anterior or a posterior subcapsular lamellar opacity at first, which later on becomes nuclear and then, uh, then it will eventually become a total cataract. Okay, so however, a typical description of cataract that is seen on retro, uh, retro illumination is that of an oil droplet cataract, as you can see here. Now, since it resembles a drop of oil, so what I mean to say is if this is your capsule, the initial cataract because of the lens hydration will start forming in the subcapsular region and then it comes in the nuclear area and eventually the entire lens is getting opacified so it forms a total cataract right however on retro illumination you will uh, the cataract will basically resemble a drop of oil and because of that this cataract is typically called an oil droplet cataract okay now progression of this cataract can actually be prevented and sometimes even the, the some stages of the cataract can be uh, regressed they can regress also if milk and milk products are eliminated from the diet in the early stages of the disease so now we as we have discussed galactosemia let us move on to the wilson's disease So what is Wilson disease? Wilson disease basically is a inherited disorder of the copper metabolism due to the mutation in the gene and the gene is ATP7B gene, right? So what happens is as the copper metabolism is affected, there will be increased deposition of the copper in the liver, in the basal ganglion and also in your eye. And this is called hepatolenticular degeneration because mainly your liver and also the lenticular structure that is your lens is actually affected. Now, an important diagnostic feature of Wilson disease that will help you to diagnose such cataracts in these patients is increased copper levels in the blood. Apart from that, the ceruloplasmin, which is a protein that binds with the copper, will actually be in decreased level in these patients. So increased copper and decreased ceruloplasmin levels is seen in case of Wilson disease. Now, as I told you that in Wilson disease, basically you will have increased copper. Now, this increased copper is going to start depositing in various locations like in the liver, in the basal ganglion and in the eye. Now, the typical sites for deposition of copper in the eye is basically in the deeper parts of the cornea at the level of the Desmet's membrane where it will accumulate mostly in the peripheral area. Now, as it accumulates in the periphery of the cornea, it will give a very... A characteristic golden brown ring appearance and that ring is called a case of Fleischer ring as can be seen in the first picture. Similarly, the copper can also deposit under the capsule of the lens and it can give a petaloid appearance okay or a um, radiate a cataract which is in the form of radiating fibers and apart from that this cataract will also have a brilliant golden green sheen to it. And because of this typical appearance in the form of petals of a flower with a golden green color sheen to it, this type of cataract that you see in Wilson disease is called a sunflower cataract. We've, we finished galactosemia, we discussed about the Wilson disease also and now we are moving forward to the Fabry's disease. So what is Fabry's disease? Fabry's disease is basically an X-linked lysosomal storage disorder. Okay, so it affects the lysosome, it is X-linked and to be more specific, it is X-linked recessive. That means it will affect the males more compared to the females. Now, what is the deficiency here? The deficiency is that of an enzyme alpha galactose. So in the lysosome, you have this glycoprotein, which is GL, which is represented by this GL3 over here. Now, this glycoprotein is actually broken down by the enzyme alpha galactose A into various smaller parts or it is basically metabolized, right? So if you have deficiency of this alpha galactose cytase A, what will happen? There will actually be an accumulation of the glycolipid in the lysosomes. Okay, so that is your Fabry's disease. So all the males with the genes basically are going to develop the disease. So a mnemonic to remember various manifestation of Fabry's disease is shown in the slide. So you can read it. 
Now, here the C, uh, you have to replace the S of Fabry's disease with a C, and C is nothing but ceramide trihexoside accumulation. Ceramide trihexoside is actually the glycoprotein 3, which gets accumulated in the lysosomes. The first picture over here actually illustrates the angiokeratomas, which are actually cutaneous lesions of the capillary seen in Fabry's disease. Okay. Apart from that, even the conjunctival vessels can show such vascular torticity and aneurysm formation. And these, for example, here, this is an aneurysm. And such vessels which are showing this torticity are called the corkscrew vessels. Now, there can also be deposition of that glycolipid 3 in the cornea and they can actually deposit um, in the cornea in the form of a world pattern. Okay, it's not very clear in the picture, but they're going to get deposited in this vortex pattern or world pattern. And this is called corneal verticillator or vortex keratopathy. Okay. But here, what are we talking about? We're basically talking about the metabolic disorders leading to a bilateral cataract, right? So definitely, Fabry's disease can also lead to cataract and the presence of bilateral cataract is almost universal in patients of Fabry's disease, okay? Now, the picture over here illustrates a wedge shape or a spoke shape posterior, capula, uh, posterior capsular cataract. So usually, they will have the spoke shape cataract in case of Fabry's disease. The next metabolic disease can, which can lead to a bilateral cataract is the Lois disease. The Lois disease is also called an oculocerebrorenal syndrome. It is again an X-linked recessive disorder that means the males are going to be affected more. The gene here is the OCRL1 gene okay? and it's basically a disorder of the amino acid metabolism. Now here again your brain, the, the neural tissue is going to get affected. The kidneys are going to get affected and apart from that, your eyes are going to be affected. Now here, the basic thing that you have to remember regarding the kidneys in Lewis disease is that this is a disorder of the amino acid metabolism and you will see that these patients are basically going to have amino aciduria or proteinuria. That means they are going to excrete um, protein or amino acids in their urine, which is also one of the diagnostic criteria to diagnose Lewis disease. Now, the classic ocular manifestation in them is actually a bilateral cataract and the cataract is almost universal and they will also have microphakia along with it. Apart from that, they can have congenital glaucomas. Okay, and the females who have Lois disease are mostly carriers. They can also have opacities in the lens, but their opacities are not going to be as severe as that of the male child having a Lois disease. Now, one very important association of Lois disease is with that of the posterior lenticonus. So I already explained to you on my part where I was explaining you about the unilateral cataracts, what is posterior lenticonus, okay? So posterior lenticonus can happen, uh, can occur as an isolated ocular anomaly or it might also be associated with Lois disease. The next metabolic condition which can lead to cataract is a diabetic cataract. Now, the diabetic cataracts are basically rare condition which typically occurs in young children or young people with type 1 diabetes mellitus, okay, which is an insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. Now, this can happen when hyperglycemia is so acute that it disturbs grossly the water balance of the body. So, what happens here is that or as the sugar levels increases acutely, that glucose instead of entering through the Krebs cycle or through the, or through the glycolysis, will also be metabolized via the aldose reductase pathway and this will lead to accumulation of the alcohol just like the galactitol here we have the sorbitol and this sorbitol will increase in the lens and as we know that sorbitol is basically a highly osmotic agent. As the amount of sorbitol increases in the lens it will cause increased osmotic gradient within the lens and because of which the water will enter inside the lens leading to hydration. This hydration can actually be seen in the, in the form of vacuole formation and swelling of the lens and ultimately there will be opacification and cataract formation. So a large number of fluid vacuoles are actually going to appear okay, in that hydrated lens and it basically appears in the anterior and the posterior part of the capsule and as you can see the lens get hydrated 
Now, because of the increased hydration, what happens is that the curvature of the lens increases and therefore they are going to come with myopia, right? As we know that in myopia, basically the lens curvature is more and therefore as the curvature increases, the power of the lens increases and therefore the image is going to be focused in front of the retina, right? Similarly, in true diabetic cataract, when the lens hydration occurs acutely, there's an increase in the power of the lens and therefore these patients are going to come to you with change in their refractive uh, uh, refraction or change uh, in the prescription and usually what you're going to find is a presence of myopia so that might be your initial uh, symptom or sign that you see in these patients now the lens because of that hydration will become cataractus and uh, it will develop these dense white subcapsular opacities in the anterior and the posterior cortex and these dense white opacities that you see in the anterior and posterior cortex will actually resemble a snowstorm and therefore this type of cataract that you see in diabetes is called diabetic snowflake cataract or a snowstorm cataract. Now the first image illustrates the snowflake cataract where the second one basically depicts the intumescence due to the acute lens hydration. Now remember all these characteristic appearances that we are discussing they may be seen early on but ultimately all cataracts get mature and it might not be possible for us to differentiate them just by their morphology. The last metabolic condition that can lead to cataract is an hypocalcemic condition. The hypocalcemia or a parathyroid tetany, it basically occurs when there's atrophy of the parathyroid glands or sometimes after a thyroidectomy operation when the parathyroids might be removed along with the thyroid. This will lead to hypocalcemia. Now, calcium levels in the aqueous are very important to maintain the health of the lens and particularly the membrane of the lens. As there's hypoglycemia, the membrane of the lens will basically get affected and this will also affect the various transport that is occurring across the membrane of the lens. As a result, the sodium concentration within the lens will increase and we know that wherever there is sodium, there's also going to be water. So as the sodium concentration increases inside the lens, the water content also will, will increase inside the lens leading to hydration and ultimately you will have cataract. Now it's trivia time. So I want you to answer in the comment section that in which infection do we see snowflake opacities in the cornea? Be very careful. What we discussed here is about the snowflake cataract. Now I want you to answer that in which infection do we see snowflake opacities occurring in the cornea as well? Here we go.